Hey, church family, we are so glad to have you with us today. This is our time as a church right now to sing and praise our God. And so we invite you to stand and sing with us. saved by grace through faith. Freedom is a song I sing. I can't contain the joy you bring. All because of your great love. Your grace so free in the power of your cross now I live. 
salvation, my freedom, you give your all for me forever. You made a way for me, and you came to my rescue. You came to my rescue, calling on your name, calling on your name. Love came down. You. Today. 
Thank you so much for joining us online, wherever you are this morning. Indeed, our chains are gone, our debt is paid. The Bible tells us that we were born into a sinful world and that that sin separates us from God. So God in his infinite wisdom sent his one and only son down to earth to live as a man and to stand in that gap for us, to fill that void between us and God that the Bible tells us we are unable to fill ourselves. So Jesus came to earth, he died, he was buried and risen from the dead three days later. And right now we're gonna commemorate that. So the bread represents the body of Christ that was beaten and bruised for you and for me. Take and eat. And the cup represents the blood of Christ that was poured out for your sins and for mine. Take and drink. Such amazing love. It's hard for us to comprehend. So today as we kind of move into offering, just wanted to offer some thoughts. First of all, we have many resources and ways that you can give to Broadway Christian Church. Uh, the first is through our website at bccmesa.com giving. 
Uh, we also have an app called Push Pay, which allows you to, to give to Broadway through that as well. And then the third way uh, is if you'd like to send in a check, you can send it in to the address that's, li- that's on the screen right now. We're living in a world where increasingly we're uh, conditioned to instant gratification. In fact, companies rely on something called ROI, return on investment. And oftentimes people ask, well, if I give to the church, what do I get back? Right? Is, is there some sort of monetary blessing that I can count on if I give to the church? And the answer is actually no. But God will bless us. He promises to bless us uh, when we give generously. In fact, in Proverbs, it says, Whoever is generous to the poor and lends to the Lord, he will repay him for his deed. So as you give today, give generously. We thank you for that. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Father, we just thank you for Broadway. Lord, we thank you for the way that this church has been able to mobilize, to be online, to reach other people in different states, Lord, and just to continue to spread the love of Christ throughout this pandemic, God. We just thank you for the generous giving of the members and just people who are watching online, Lord. We pray that that will just continue. We pray that you'll use those gifts and offerings to further your kingdom here on earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, friends, and welcome to Connect TV. I'm your host, Pastor Frankie, and this is my co-host, Miss Shelby. In today's sermon, we are going to learn about King David and how he thought that he could hide his sin from God. When we hide our sins, it's easy to feel like we are covered, and we can pretend like nothing is wrong. But we forget that God already knows everything about us, and hiding our sin only causes us to be blind. Instead, we need to confess our sins to God so that we can be covered by Him and be able to see again. Here's an example of what we need. This is Zach. Zach did something he shouldn't have and tried to cover it up himself instead of trusting God and confessing his sin to him. Zach tried to get through his day by covering himself to hide what he did. This did not work well for Zach. This is also Zach. This time, Zach confessed his sin to God and is now covered by His grace. Zach went through his day covered by God instead of himself. So you see, it doesn't work so well to try and cover up or hide our sins. But if we tell God when we do something we shouldn't, and we ask Him to forgive us, He does. Then we can see clearly because we are not hiding in the dark, but covered by His forgiveness. That's all for today. See you guys next week. Welcome everyone to Broadway Church Online. I'm so glad that you joined us today. Uh, Did you like that bumper you just saw? Uh, That's a great video bumper as we launch our summertime sermon series on the Psalms. And I'm so looking forward to going through the Psalms with you this summer as we look at uh, these beautiful expressions in God's Word of what it means to live life together with God. But there's a word that shows up a lot of times in the Psalms that we sort of ignore and overlook, and that word is Selah, S-E-L-A-H. Say that word with me, Selah, 
And, uh, and Selah is a, a beautiful word, but it's, it's sort of an afterthought for a lot of people. It's like a bookmark, you know, that you don't really look at, you don't really read. In fact, uh, translators don't really even know exactly what the word Selah uh, stands for. But one thing is sure, uh, that when you look at the Psalms as poetry, uh, think of the, uh, of the word Selah as a pause in poetry. Or think of it like when you're playing a, a musical piece and the composer writes in a, a rest that's an extended rest. It's sort of like that. Now, the word Selah doesn't appear in every translation of the Bible. For example, if you've got the New International Version, uh, the word Selah is a footnote at the bottom of the page in all likelihood. Uh, a few other translations, it does show up right there in the text like the King James Version and the ESV Version. But, um, but I, the way I look at the word Selah is, it's a way just to, just to think about what you've read. It's God's way of saying to you, just take a pause for a minute. Just, just look at this, think about this, meditate on these words, dwell on these thoughts. In fact, we're going to use the word Selah as an acronym uh, for our way that we want to approach the Psalms as we go through them together uh, the, in this summertime uh, series. So, Selah, S-E-L-A-H, as an acrostic, Selah, S is stop. Uh, stop means, in this case, to cease from all your busyness and all your labors and just prepare your heart to spend time with God. E is to exhale. Uh, you take a breath in, and now, as you breathe in, now breathe out deeply and just feel the rhythm of your heart begin to slow down. L is to lean in. And when you're in a conversation with someone and when you lean in, you're showing an active and an avid interest in whatever they're saying. And that's what we want to do with God as we approach His Word. We're going to lean into the Word, lean into God's truths. And then the A of Selah is to ask. We ask God, God, what do you want to say to me? God, I, I, want, to, I want to be able to listen to what you say. The H is to hear, uh, and, and it's like the prophet Samuel as a little boy. He heard the voice in the night, and, uh, and Samuel, recognizing finally that it was the voice of God, said, Speak, Lord, for your, uh, your servant is listening. And that's what we want to do, Selah, to stop, to exhale, to lean into God, to ask and to hear, Selah. Uh, the purpose of Selah, that word in the Psalms, is to remind us to think deeply about what we've been reading. God is saying, don't miss this. This is important. This really matters. Because it's so easy sometimes to miss the important truths that God has for us, to skip right over them, to gloss right over them, and not really to pay attention to the words and the thoughts that are so helpful to us. I think of Selah as more than a word. I think of it as a, as a discipline, as a practice of the spiritual life. It's, it's the way that you live your life before God. It's a way that you discipline your mind and your spirit and your body, even your ears, to hear what God has to say to you. Selah. Think of it uh, this way. Think of it uh, li like when you go to, to a, a ball game. And if you get there early enough, a lot of times you'll see the, uh, the athletes whether they're football players or baseball or basketball or whatever the sport is, they're always warming up. They're stretching their, their, their muscles. They're, they're loosening their, their joints so that they're ready to play to their optimum capabilities. And that's what we're doing when we, when we discipline our minds and our hearts and our spirits to Selah, to hear what God has to say to us. So stop, exhale, lean in, ask, and hear. Now, today we're going to look at Psalm 32. That's where we're going to begin our sermon series. And uh, this is a message about forgiveness, and I'm titling this message, Cover or Be Covered. And this is a Psalm of David. So, Psalm 32, I'm going to read the first five verses, and I'm going to insert the word Selah where it actually uh, should be in the text, even though it doesn't show up in the NIV version of the Bible. Psalm 32. David writes, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through all my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped 
as in the heat of summer. Selah. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Let me begin my message on forgiveness this way. Back in World War II, when the war was finally over, peace treaties were signed with both Europe and Japan, and under the leadership of General Douglas MacArthur, the Allied armies uh, were making their way toward Tokyo, uh, and they bypassed hundreds of little islands in the, uh, in the Pacific Ocean. And, uh, and even though the war was over, there were still tens of thousands of Japanese soldiers uh, stationed on those islands that thought the war was still on. And so they were hiding in the jungles, they were hiding in the mountains, and, and after the war concluded, the Americans went to those islands and said, the war is over, peace has been declared, uh, lay down your arms and come out. But they didn't come out uh, because the Japanese soldiers thought that the Americans were playing a trick on them. So finally, the emperor of Japan made a recording and they broadcast that recording with loudspeakers into the jungles. The war is over. Peace has been declared. Lay down your weapons and come out. And they came out. But here's the oddity of that particular experience. The last Japanese soldier came out of the jungle in 1974, 29 years after the peace treaty had been signed. 29 years. And they asked him, why did it take you so long? And his answer was, I was afraid. So I hid. I was afraid. See, the Bible says that you and I are sinners. All of us have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. I don't think I need to tell you that and remind you of your sin. I don't need to remind myself of my sin because every day is a reminder that we're sinners, each and every one of us. But how do we deal with our sin? That's really the question. And that's the issue that's at stake here in Psalm 32. What do we do with that sin? I think there are only really a couple of options that we have. And the first option is that we can try to cover our sins ourselves. We can try to cover ourselves. You know, if you've ever been at war with an enemy that's stronger than yourself, it's, it's natural to fear. And, and when we're afraid, we hide. And that's the spiritual dynamic that's, that runs through Psalm 32. We're sinners and we hide. Think about it this way. What was the very first thing that Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden after their sin? They tried to hide from God. God came walking in the garden and he called out, where are you? And Adam said, we, were, we heard your voice. We were afraid, so we hid. That's the natural human response. We try to hide. Uh, tradition says that uh, David wrote this psalm after he committed adultery with Bathsheba and after the murder of her husband, Uriah. And David went into hiding. He tried to cover himself. He, tied, he tried to pretend. He, he lived in hypocrisy. And he writes about that experience when he says in verse 3, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. And that's what we do, isn't it? We keep silent. We pretend. We cover. We hide. Then he says, I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I did not cover up my iniquity. Dallas Willard is an author who has since passed away the last couple of years. And he tells about the time that his three-year-old granddaughter was being babysat by, by his wife, uh, her grandmother. And she was playing in the backyard and, and she discovered how to make mud in the backyard. And she called it, um, she called it warm chocolate. Well, it didn't take long till this little precious little girl was covered in mud and her grandmother had been reading a book and wasn't paying much attention, finally discovered that her granddaughter was covered in mud and she got her cleaned up and then she said, now, no more of that. And then this time, Grandma turned her chair to face that little child and pretty soon the little girl was right back in the mud with her warm chocolate. Then this time, though, she made eye contact with her grandmother, and she said, don't look at me, Nana, okay? Don't look at me. And, and Nana, who was a little bit of a codependent, said, okay, uh, I won't look at you. And, and so several times, this little girl playing in the mud would look at her grandma and say, don't look at me, Nana, don't look at me. Dallas Willard writes about that in one of his books, 
And then he goes on to say this. He says, we're all like a little child in that we find it important that God not look at us in our wrongdoing. We hide. Imagine a man who, um, imagine a man who says good, good night to his wife, and uh, then he says to her, listen, you go on to bed. I'm going to stay up a little while, and as soon as he's certain she's asleep, he turns on his computer and logs in and goes to a website that has pornographic images. And even though he's a Christian, he's looking at those images, and at the same time, he's uttering a little prayer to God that says, don't look at me, okay? Imagine a student taking an exam. The, the adrenaline's flowing. This is an important test, and she's crammed a lot of facts and info into her noggin, but the facts are spinning in her head, and she just feels lost. So she surreptitiously takes out a, a cheat sheet. Her soul is bothered, but she needs those answers. God, don't look at me, okay? Now, I'll come back to you tomorrow morning when I open my Bible again, but for now, would you please just turn away? Her need outweighs her fear of God. Or imagine a woman who's out with coffee for a friend as she says something mildly sarcastic about her husband and she senses a sympathetic note from her friend across the table. And so for the next hour, she roasts her husband. But even as that conversation is going on, there's another taking place simultaneously that says, don't look at me, God, okay? Just turn your face away. Why do we try to cover up our sin? How do we try to cover our sin? Well, there are a variety of methods and tricks I think that we'll use. David used deception. You remember the story of David and Bathsheba? She was not his wife. She was another man's wife. But he saw her, he desired her, and he took her, and she became pregnant with his child. And then David tried to cover it up. This king brought her husband home from the war, and, uh, and tried to get them to sleep together so that the man would think that the baby was his. It didn't work. Uh, we trick, we, we spin, we deceive. We say, don't look at me, God. I'm, I'm fine. I, I'm good. Sometimes we try to cover our sin by simply ignoring it, you know, out of sight, out of mind. I wonder if that's what the apostle Peter did. Now, think about this guy, Peter. Uh, Probably there was no human on earth closer to Jesus than Peter was during the three years that they spent together. And then at the hour that Jesus needed Peter the most, what did Peter do? He failed. He, he, he ran away. He, he denied knowing Jesus. And then Jesus rose from the dead. But apparently things weren't right because there had been no reconciliation. So what does Peter do? He returns to his old occupation of fishing. We don't know exactly his motivation, but I'm wondering if maybe returning to that old way of life helped him to forget what he had done. Another method that we use to hide our sin is justification. This is, I think, my personal favorite. We, we try to justify ourselves. We try to justify our sinful behaviors. No, I shouldn't have done it. I know that, but, but those people made me do it. Or, or my kids made me do it. Or, or my friends made me. You know, if my wife wasn't so cold and distant, then this never would have happened. But does deception take away our sin? Does ignoring it take away our sin? Does justifying our sinful actions, does that take it away? Listen, we're sinners, and, and we sin, and, and we hide. And we use a variety of methods to, to, to mask our sins. But the Bible says that when we try to cover our sins ourselves that God's hand falls heavy on us. When we try to mask our sins, we, we fade, we groan, we wilt. Psalm 32 verse 3 says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. David was saying, I've got no strength. He says, I'm like a grape that's been left out in the sun. I'm, I'm like a raisin. I'm, I'm spiritually dried up. I'm, I'm fading away. There is a physical response that we have when we have a troubled conscience. Our, our mind spins. Our stomach churns. In fact, there's been studies done of, of our brain uh, using brain imaging technology. They studied the human mind, and what they've found out 
is that when we lie, there's actually more brain activity than when we're telling the truth. And one researcher explains it this way. He says, lying is complex behavior. There's a lot more activity. There's a lot more interactions. There's a lot more firing of the synapses when we lie than when we're actually doing truth-telling, which is what happens, isn't it? What happens when you lie, when, when you try to cover your sins? Your mind spins, your stomach churns, your heart pounds, and David says we groan. We feel sapped of all strength and energy. Can I ask you a question? Is that really the way you want to live your life? Is it just to try to cover your sins, to pretend that they don't exist, to justify them, to deny them, to deceive? Is there a better way? I think Scripture points us to a better way right in this particular passage. We can be covered by God's forgiveness. We can be covered by His forgiveness. We can follow David's lead and confess our sins to God as David did. Here's the way uh, verse 5 reads. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin, Selah. We acknowledge what we've done. We confess it. We become transparent before this God who sees everything anyway. And we say, God, I've done wrong. I've, I've broken your holy laws. I've made my money into an idol. I've committed adultery in my mind or with my body. I've cheated. I've stolen things that didn't belong to me. I've criticized others needlessly. I have disrupted the unity of the body of believers. I've sinned, God. I did it. Because every time you sin, you offend God. I may sin against you. But primarily, any time I sin, it's against God because He's involved. Because God is a part of every human relationship. Really, tr the, the truth is that the way I treat you is the way I'm treating God. So when we confess, we must always confess to God, I've done wrong. I'm sorry, I repent. And since we've done wrong to another person, we also have to confess to that person as well. I read a story about Dwight L. Moody, the, the 19th century evangelist. He was in England conducting um, evangelistic meetings. And while he was there, he fell in love with those beautiful English lawns, so manufactured and so beautifully green, so wonderfully kept. So when Moody came back to the United States, he decided that he would like to have a lawn just like the ones he had seen across the ocean. So he worked and he worked and he raked and he groomed, and just as his lawn was beginning to come in, just as it was beginning to look beautiful, just as, as everything was turning green and lush, his two boys let the horses loose from the barn. And those horses came and trampled his beautiful yard and absolutely destroyed it. And Dwight L. Moody lost it. He blew his top and sent his boys to their bedrooms. Later that day, they... His two sons heard their father's heavy footsteps outside their bedroom door, and they were convinced that now the real punishment would take place. But Dwight Moody walked into the bedroom and placed his hand on each of his son's, son's heads, and he said, I'm sorry, I was wrong. That wasn't the way Jesus taught. We confess to God, and we confess to others. But I think we also confess as a group. One of the beautiful things about gathering as the church, one of the things that we do, and one of the reasons that we partake of the Lord's Supper every Sunday is because we as a community of believers understand the importance of coming together, whether you're home uh, and by yourself or with a group of people, whether you're in a congregation, a room filled with people. However it is, what we're doing corporately when we're taking the Lord's Supper is we're saying, I've sinned. I acknowledge my sin before you, Jesus, but I thank you for your precious death. I thank you for your atoning work on the cross for me. We sin, we hide, we try to cover our sins, but when we finally confess, Scripture says God extends his shalom to us. I love that word shalom because it's far richer than just peace. 
Shalom is fullness. Shalom is spiritual prosperity. Shalom is the blessing of God in your life. David says, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Notice that this word forgiveness is a passive thing. It's something that's done for me. Someone else is doing the forgiving. We can try to cover ourselves or we can be covered by God's forgiveness. That word forgiven in this verse means to carry away. How happy, how blessed, how fortunate, how full of peace is the one whose sins has been carried away on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And then it says, blessed is the one whose sins are covered. Cover means to conceal, to veil, to put out of sight. Think of when you have company coming over to your house and you're dashing around the house, picking up all the clutter. And what do you do with all the clutter? Where do you put it? So you, you, you stuff everything into a spare bedroom and close the door. You conceal it so that no one can see it. You cover the clutter. That's what God does for us. He takes our sins and he puts them away. We don't have to stare at the clutter of our sin anymore. We don't have to focus on those things. The way the prophet Isaiah says it is so beautiful. Isaiah says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Scarlet is called an ineradicable color, meaning, have you ever tried to take a grape juice stain out of a white tablecloth? Good luck with that. And yet, though our sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God says, I'll pull the plug on your sins. I'm, I'm not going to stare at them anymore. I'll cover them myself. So here's the option. You can try to cover up your own sin yourself, and you'll be miserable. Or you can confess to God, and you'll be blessed. You'll be covered. Scripture says how blessed, how happy, how fortunate is the person whose sins are covered. The war with God is over. God has made peace with us through the shed blood of His Son on the cross. What if we agree to terms of peace with Him? What if we lay down our arms? What if we come out of hiding? When we do all of that, we will know the peace of God, the peace that passes all human understanding. Blessed is the one, it says, whose sins are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Thank God for what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. Would you join me for prayer? Father, we've all done it. We've all tried to cover our own sins. We've all used the means of deception or we've ignored them or we've tried to justify our own sinful behaviors, but we know none of that works. And our minds spin and our stomachs churn. Our, our, we grow weak. We grow faint spiritually. The only way we can truly be accomplished in this business is for you to cover us yourself. And that you've done through your son, Jesus. We thank you for this wonderful Psalm 32 that helps us to see that when we try to do it ourselves, we'll only be miserable spiritually. But when we rely on you, when we allow you to cover us through your son, that's when we truly find peace, the peace that passes all human understanding. And so today I pray for every person that will know that peace with you, God, that will lay down our arms, that will be in peace with you. The war has finally been over, and peace has been declared. May we live at peace with you and with others, all through Jesus, in whose name I pray, amen.